afternoon and welcome to this edition of the Marine Fish Conservation Network's Waterside Chat. I'm Tom Sadler. I'll be the host. I'm joined today by Justin Zellner of the WAVE Foundation. And um, just a little bit of housekeeping. We will be recording this and making it available on our website and YouTube and Facebook and all the normal social media channels. And um, if you have questions, uh, you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them um, as we have time. So Justin, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, so wonderful to see your glowing face um, and uh, happy to, to be uh, with your audience today to, to, to share some things about what we're up to. Well, I'm, I'm delighted. I'm, I only wish that we could do these face to face, but that's the times we live in, right? Um, yeah, that so would let be great. Me, let's let's jump right into it. Um, the wave has taken some very creative approaches to food insecurity. That's how you and I got together. Um, so let's start with that. Um, the 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 thing that grabbed me, Justin, is that the the wave's tagline, which reads, "We strengthen community health, regional economies." environmental stability by creating equitable, resilient, and more sustainable food systems. Tell me a little bit about sort of what that means. What That's a great why, but tell us a little bit about the how. Yeah, um, you know, great, great question. Uh, probably would take the full hour. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. And I think I think to answer the question, you, you do have to kind of go back a little bit. Um, and, and it, 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 you know, uh, to understand the opportunities that we've been blessed to, 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 to have really goes back to kind of the, the, the genesis of the WAVE and the WAVE Foundation and how, um, and, and I'll rapidly get into COVID, which gave us the opportunity to, to really dig sure. our heels into um, food, food systems in particular, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So, um, we started the wave here in the, the great Northwest uh, corner of the United States, thinking about really um, uh, large scale approaches, North stars, if you would, about um, programs that we could get behind uh, around equity, um, environmental stewardship, um, diversity, um, res you know, resilience, um, really about healthy communities. And those core areas really focused in on things like energy and transportation, but but really it's all about the food system, right? How how do we look at food systems and make them better through the leverage point? And the leverage point being a couple hundred people getting together from the sports and entertainment industry, the convention business, business and industry campuses, those places like Amazon and Nike and Microsoft. Um, Thinking about amphitheaters and music and 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 ski areas and these large public venues that I have a rich history with, I think we'll get into a little bit later. Sure. But but how do we how do we look at those those operations that have incredibly big food and beverage systems and approaches and and leverage ourselves so we can we can support doing better when it comes to developing healthier communities through food systems, right? So that's that's sort of that large, the BHAG goal that, that gets talked about. Then, then we all agree here that we want to do something really amazing um, and, and then expand that, right? Duplicate that, replicate that across the country. Um, being pioneers, if you would, of, uh, of these sorts of systems approaches out of the Northwest, which, you know, being a Portland native and somebody here, uh, I, I take very seriously, and I, I think we've shown through the past we've done that before. And then, kabam, here comes COVID, right? Um, a, a pandemic, you know, stops and seizes all operations that I just mentioned, just just right, like right. the rest, just like the rest of the country, right? And so, we have this kind of opportunity that kind of landed in our laps, and we took it pretty seriously. We got, we we received some funding. Um, from the government, uh, we received some funding from philanthropy organizations to say, hey, look, you have this really cool model where you want to bring local, um, um, uh, economically 
uh, diverse foods into these food and beverage operations. You want to be thinking about environmental stewardship, socio diversity, and 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 sort of un, you know helping support underrepresented pr food producers. Why don't you do that during the pandemic? And we kind of went, kind of stopped for a second and said, no, we're not an organization that does food and nutrition relief. Um, but then we quickly rallied, you know, our partners and said, well, why not? You know, it, 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 is there an opportunity um, that that might exist where 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 we could serve a, a role? And we did a quick landscape assessment and, and really found that um, rural uh, per communities, particularly tribal, um, were not being served uh, immediately by the sort of centralized food bank nutrition relief of, of COVID response. Um, and so we, we went ahead and developed a, a program around food and nutrition relief that really took that North Star approach and said, you know, what could we be doing in the interim? Uh, we did not know, none of us knew how long the pandemic was going to last, of course, right. in the beginning. Um, but, you know, what could we do in the interim to sort of show the way? And so that's really where this all began. And it, but is you, you took your existing model and moved it into the pandemic arena, if you will. Um, so give me a couple of examples of some of the stuff that you guys did when you, as you were making that transition. Yeah. Especially some... in the indigenous community. I'm, I'm interested yeah. in that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and so um, we, we, again, I'd mentioned that we received some uh, support to kind of do this work from the philanthropic uh, community. Um, I've got a background working, um, and I think we're going to get into it a little bit further, in, in philanthropy globally. Sustainable fisheries is one of the programs that, that, that I've worked on over the, over the last couple of decades. And some of those um, partners uh, that have been you know, really lifting up the sustainable fisheries uh, um, industry, uh, just like anybody else, was incredibly worried. All that hard work that we're we, we you know that we build up to this point, a pandemic comes, cripples everything. Are these fisheries going to survive um, the pandemic? Right, that was sort of the hypothesis. What can we do to help them? And so, so a lot of the philanthropic groups that were involved again um, in de helping develop sustainable fisheries models and fisheries um, stepped in and and did use their money to buy that fish, right? To buy those harvests to make right. sure our fishers. Um, you know, could, could could get through. They shipped um, you know hundreds of thousands of pounds of of fish out of Alaska waters, Bristol Bay, uh, through Alaskan Zone, um, et cetera, and brought that to Bellingham. We picked it up out of Washington and started distributing that food, that 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 you know awesome fish um, into tribal nation communities. And so what we did was you know put to you know, we used that as the base protein, you know, um, healthy. Uh, sustainable produced foods, uh, culturally relevant, um, incredibly important um, as we put food boxes together and distributed it to over 45,000 tribal uh, community members um, here in the Northwest and other places across the country. We, we mixed in, right, um, foods that again came from that model. Um, what is local? Um, what, what, are, what are farmers um, and, and ranchers that are, 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 are using sustainable practices that we can purchase from and actually put into these boxes to go alongside that awesome core protein of fish um, and, and actually buy from tribal producers. Um, we, we bought um, well over 60,000 pounds of Columbia River tribally caught salmon from fishers that um, were left with no markets um, you know, during the pandemic and then turn that food right around and gave it back to the tribal communities. Um, you know, again, what, what a great multiplier of using dollars um, for food and nutrition relief to actually support the, the, the producers doing the right thing. So that to me is one of the key elements of this. And, and I was struck by you know, we've been involved together in some of this work. And one of the things, and I'm going to quote him, I'm going to try to keep the from choking on my uh, emotions here, but one of the tribal elders of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs said, it will take a long time 
for our tribal members to begin eating just traditional foods once again. I have happy tears in my heart and mind for getting to witness an outside entity help make this a reality. I thank all involved with this vital traditional foods venture for a healthy lifestyle. To me, Justin, that sums up the value proposition of what you were doing, taking a very unconventional approach to a very serious problem. Is that a fair way to characterize it? Yeah, Delson Suppa Sr., um, uh, an elder from the Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs, and a, a, a you know and a, a heartfelt friend uh, of 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 mine and my, for my family, um, you know, wonderful quote. Um, it always kind of actually right gets you, gets you yeah, pretty, it gets you pretty emotional. Um, the development of authentic relationships in our Northwest tribal communities. Um, is something for me and the rest of the partners of, of the Wave Foundation, um, that includes the businesses involved as well, um, that, that in itself um, is enough for us to say we did good during the pandemic. Um, uh, I have another story that, that Tom, you probably you know, heard me say, um, you know, we really got into the weeds um, as far as purchasing food, finding the producers, um, understanding their barriers, right? And we'll get into right. that here in a, in a minute. Um, uh, that's been talked about, you know, you know, by the government, USDA, et cetera. But we'll get it, you know, like we got into the weeds, really understanding, you know, what was preventing us from buying the food to put in food boxes, right? You know, that's just an example. Right. But, um, we, you know, we were, we were in the field, um, so every other week, um, you know, I would hop in a truck. You might see my dog walking behind me. Uh, yeah. He was my co co pilot, and we would, you know, distribute food boxes to um, uh, tribal communities along the Columbia River, um, up in Yakima Valley, um, and um, I, I uh, was in Georgeville, uh, which is a Yakima Nation um, community, uh, in the truck, you know, unloading some boxes, and I I heard an elder voice outside of the box truck and. And uh, they were demanding to talk to whoever's in charge. And of course, I'm going, uh-oh, you know, uh-oh, uh -oh, here we go. Uh -oh. You know, there's something, something's wrong. And so I hopped out of the truck and, um, uh, she, you know, the, 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 this elder who, who was a grandmother taking care of her uh, uh, gr grandchild from basically birth. And the child is almost a teenager at this point. Um, you wanted to let me know that, uh, that, that that granddaughter had had diabetes basically her entire life. Um, and as Delson, you know, uh, in his quote mentioned, we, we were, you know, providing food for you know, a couple of years um, that was healthy, uh, culturally relevant um, and nutritious, clean label. And she just wanted to hug a person responsible for helping her grandchild um, get rid of diabetes. And, and, and her doctor said, you know, the only thing we did different is feed this food, right? Um, salmon and wild rice and healthy vegetables and fruits um, and foods that didn't contain, you know, the real negative stuff that is common um, to communities uh, of color, communities in need, let alone a pandemic, right? Well, and, and that I think is part of the, 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 the um, thing that attracted me to the, to the work that you all are doing is that it's, you could go get a box truck full of fast food. I'm not going to put any names on it, but fast food and dump it off or or pass it out somewhere. Or you could take the extra step that you guys did, which was find it locally sourced, find it. Um, I think what, what, what struck me was it was relevant to their historic diets, right? That's, that was a part of the, the equation that, you know, uh, Fast food's not a, 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 at least someone in my advanced age, that was not what I was raised on. And, um, you know, being able to take that, do that extra work to get that kind of food took a lot of ingenuity and, and commitment. And that to me was what uh exemplified the the work that the wave is doing yeah it, you know listen um 
uh, I'm getting what they call long in the tooth, right? Um, and yeah. I'm using, I'm using. I my used to have hair, hair, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. And and so we we can only use our past experiences to help inform us on, you know, how we move forward um, with intentionality and 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 and, and you know. And, and making better choices, right? So we might get into this a little bit, but but part of um, my past history is uh, helping well, work. Let's, let's yeah. go there, right? Well, let's great. tell yeah. us the Justin Zellner's backstory. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, I, I grew up, you know, um, at, with, with with not a lot of money. Um, you know, my family um, what was was fairly you know poor. I think in the demographic standpoint, they're they're still probably, um, you know, my parents are still, you know, economically in, in a very um, low level of, of, of sort of class when it comes to income, um, you know, coming, you know, coming from, you know, working class farm, you know, farm, do, doing some farming to food, you know, find your food, being roofers, taking care of horses, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so I learned very early on, I think, you know, I'm very humble with, with my upbringing that, um, that, you know, you, you must be a caretaker of your community, and and that's how you just sort of live. That's how you survive. Um, I I quickly um, after graduating from the University of Oregon, um, this is before I got, got my MBA, but uh, I jumped into the ski industry because I was snowboard. Uh, I was one of the original snowboarders back in the day. Really? Um, yeah, like you know, like literally Sorel boots and 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 a snowboard that wasn't even you know it was just made of plywood. Um, wow. So, um, you know, so I I. I you know, I thought that was my calling, right? Uh, which it was awesome. I worked at a ski area called Willamette Pass Ski Area, and the owner Tim Wiper and I are still friends. And you know, he really entrusted me to to just you know go at it and 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 do a lot of good stuff. And I remember um, uh, this is what I, how I tell the story at least. Um, I remember one night running the 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 you know night skiing in the lodge, and and I kind of just decided to hike up the mountain and and kind of lay, just kind of laid there, looked up at the stars, and. I had watched um, my ski seasons um, in my very short amount of time on the earth um, go from 125 days to 100 days to 90 days to 60 days to 50 days to sometimes not even opening at all because of the impacts of sort of, you know, climate um, and the global warming that had impacted the ski industry. And I kind of realized like, hey, I want to do something about this and I probably shouldn't stay in this industry much longer because I don't know if I'm going to have a job. And so uh, I found a job with my next like love, right? I was born and raised in Portland. The Portland Trailblazers was, you know, my, my heart and soul. I, you know, I bled uh, black and, 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 and red, the team colors. Uh, they gave me an opportunity to do an incredible job, uh, which led me to, um, you know, you know, working on government and public affairs, community, uh, you know, affairs, that kind of job. Um, and Paul Allen, the late Paul Allen really, gave me my opportunities um, by working for him both at the Trailblazers, but then I did work for him up at Vulcan, um, uh, which is the headquarter company uh, uh, in, in Seattle. And if those viewers that may not uh, remember who Paul Allen is, he was um, co-founder co uh, uh, of Microsoft with Bill Gates and a, a, a huge philanthropist um, and really wanted to see what we had developed what I was able to to put together based on his blessing in Portland around sort of how a sports team could play a giant role in society, uh, creating you know good. He wanted to see that scale up. Uh, we started a nonprofit called the the Green Sports Alliance, and a sports greening movement went across the whole country, and then eventually led to a global movement. Um, and I was one of the faces of all of that, uh, putting that together and. As, Expand as, on that a little yeah, bit, Justin. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. It's because um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting story. It's not something you both you either associate with Paul Allen or the Trailblazers. So I don't think a lot of people know about it, and I'd like you to brag on yourself a little yeah. bit. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, yeah, we uh, Larry, Larry Miller uh, was the president of the Portland Trailblazers at the time. He's the um, uh, sort of the president and founder of Nike Air Jordan, right? Like, so that's right. becoming a thing again. I think there's a movie. Well, it, it, there's out, a right? whole movie now. There's a whole movie coming out. Yep. And, and so uh, at the, he was the president of the Blazers at the time and had that Nike philosophy that, you know, you could do anything, right? Um, right. And so, uh, you know, you know, obviously he worked you know, very closely with Paul and, um, you know, there was some cool stuff we were doing on some environmental affairs uh, through an arena, right? Like an arena in Portland, like actually taking 
you know, understanding their 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 footprint, their this this thing they call now scope three carbon footprint, you know, um, and and, and no saying, pun intended, you know, right? Right? Yeah, and saying <laughs> like, how do we eradicate that? How how do we? I remember I came up with a plan that said, um, you know, we want to be the you know one of the leaders uh, of this movement in the sports entertainment industry, and Larry got up and and erased one of and said, I want to be the leader. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the Nike mentality that he brought, um, I think, to the Trailblazers. And Paul loved that. And and so, you know, we became this kind of little darling arena that said we're going to play a role um, in, in society, much like Muhammad Ali and Billie Jean King and Jackie Robinson. Right. Like sports plays this amazing role in moving us emotionally. Um, it has an opportunity. Right. The leverage point of sport is that we can actually leverage that cultural influence to do good. So that's exactly what we did in creating sort of the sport greening movement, but to scale it, right? You got to have an, an organization. So we put a nonprofit together called the Green Sports Alliance. And we did just that. We, you know, we went out 10 years later, you know, all the sports, the professional sports leagues, and including NASCAR and tennis association, football, basketball, baseball, hockey, all, all, of, a, all of a sudden had an environmental you know, um, chapter uh, of their in their playbooks, right? Like they're going to play a role in that. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, now the Olympics has a chapter. You know, when they go right. out uh, to to for host cities, and then FIFA and World Cup and the UN all of a sudden, and the you know, and EU is inviting us over to Europe to say, tell us more about what you did and how we can do it. And then we have a Green Sports Alliance in 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 Japan and Australia and you know South America. And it's like so it took off. But here's the thing. Something that I learned through that process, right? So I'll come back to the, the, the shared experiences and learnings. Um, right. First, um, having that opportunity to work for Paul Allen what, what was a blessing. And um, I, I worked with a colleague of mine who's also known in this space, uh, uh, Dr. Dune Ives. Um, you know, she, she's worked on sustainable fisheries projects and, and all kinds of, you know, global climate stuff. Um, and I learned from her that in order to look at systems approaches, you must think and, and move both the levers of demand and supply, right? So right. demand supply force. We're going to get to that here in just a minute. Paul Allen sort of um, infiltrated my brain to let me know that you can make global impact, right? Like, like right, right. you can think that big. It's a blessing and a curse. I, 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 I sent Jody Allen um, a note about a year or two ago, and, you know, his sister who's running things now. And I worked with her pretty closely. Um, that you know, that was it's a blessing and a curse to know that you actually can make impact at a global level because we've done it, right? Um, right, right. Yeah, and and then you know, working there, you know, you've got an opportunity, right? You, you sometimes get blessed with, and you know, the opportunity to make change happen. And I do think, right, that COVID gave us this opportunity. Uh -huh. uh, first, it gave us the opportunity to do something in this space, as opposed to just saying, philosophically, we would love all of you in this industry to do better, use your budgets better uh, in food and beverage and support this. We actually got a chance to get in the weeds and actually develop these relationships with the producers, right. understand better what the barriers and constraints are, instead of just reading about it on a report. Um, you know, and, and third, develop, you know, like understand what could we be doing in this space, right? So how could we help develop programs? So that's one thing that um, I learned with the green sports movement is that it is important that you also develop a program that people can say, okay, you're in it, you're helping us, um, as opposed to just kind of taking a typical nonprofit NGO, here's a vision, we want you to do it, but not ever really Doing it? Does that Doing make sense, Tom? Yeah, like, sure. there's a lot of nonprofits that have jumped in for stuff, but they haven't really done the programmatic work, right? So, so I use all that experience to say, great, we've got an opportunity right now to do this. So, um, while we will continue to do food and nutrition relief programming as it comes up, right? Like, we're not going to forget about that. We have a model. We'd love to see that model being used by community foods. Uh, you know, we'd love to see it by the food banks. We'd love to see the government support more of those programs. So we're not going to forget about that, but we're using that opportunity. We're leveraging that to move on to the systemic change, right? That That's what we're really up to. 
and, and the leverage point that we've got. And now that, you know, sort of COVID is coming, you know, receded a bit, you know, we're getting back to normal to some degree. Um, and now, now we need to move, move that forward. So for the last year, that's sort of what we've been doing. I hope that's helpful in framing the sort of what we have in front of us in the opportunity. For sure, for sure. And I want to step back a little bit more to, um, I don't want to say the history, but the good work that you did during the pandemic. Um, if folks want to, you know, sort of learn where, what that impact was, there's stuff on your website, right, that shows the, the statistics and all that. And I, I don't have them off the top of my head, and I don't expect you to, but they can find that impact, right? Yeah, um, the wave nw.org. I'm sure it'll be linked um, right, uh, you we'll know, on, the, on the session. Sure. Um, but you know, within a very small amount of time, um, you know, we distributed about eight million pounds of food. You know, um, and so when you're thinking about that um, economic impact, well, it's not you know, it's not as large as the central food banks. I mean, they, they, they did a lot more during the pandemic, you know, two years during the pandemic. Um, but what we did get to, you know, do again is to see how, you know, an order of a couple thousand bottles of value produced, tribally produced um, uh, salsas and salts and things like that from uh, Sakari Farms, a, 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 a tribally owned, uh, women owned, uh, small sort of farm, um, and food producer out of uh, Sisters, which is near Bend, Oregon, and how that sort of commitment to purchase that to to add to our food boxes enabled them to make investments, right? To to increase their farm capacity by three hundred percent, right? That that's a very small commitment that equaled big impact, right? And so through those sort of stories of how we know that in the industrial food system, if we can get um, our food and beverage partners, and, and I'll, I'll start to talk about that now, you know, people like Delaware North, Compass Group, Sodexo, um, you know, who are serving and are the sort of main providers of food and beverage operations, hospitality to convention centers, arenas, stadiums, university campuses, um, food, you know, uh, business and industry where, you know, where, where people work, those campuses, if they can, if they're enabled, right, to commit to purchase orders from our underrepresented food producers in our community. So these are, um, you know, tribal, uh, Black, Indigenous, um, uh, Hispanic, um, Latino, women, rural producers, right? These are these are the, the exact thing that during the pandemic was highlighted as we want food from source from these places, right? So how, how do we do that better? And again, supply and demand forces, we need to look at both, right? And so on the demand side, we know, right, we, we, we know through both the last couple of years and during the pandemic, and we just sort of know now from research and, and our own um, you know, research that, that we have done, right? That we've got the demand for this sort of approach, right? We 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 want foods that are healthier for us from our local communities that are culturally relevant. The Sedexos, the Compass Group, the Delaware North, they know that their clients are saying, um, we, we would love to feature these foods for, you know, to to, to help us with our and you know environmental social governance our ESG um, you know uh, goals of equity um, climate um, you know you know supporting local communities and 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 those types of impacts right so so also on the sort of demand side we seize the day right so carpe diem right this is our right. opportunity right to 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 start moving things forward so um, the. Again, if there's a, a bit of a silver lining in the pandemic where you found your experience with the Green Sports Alliance and bringing those venues to a place where they appreciated and then committed to doing that kind of thing within their community, you, you learned the 
of the opportunity that came from having to then take that and use it to say, okay, I've got people who need food. And I could go and do, as I was saying earlier, you know, I could go to McDonald to a, a fast food outlet and fill a truck full of it and bring it to the table. Or I could take a different approach and see what was the historic, the legacy foods and see how we could do that for them in this small scale. And now what I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing, is you're looking at how do we do this with some of the big food product providers like Sodexo, like Compass, um, and you've got you've got commitments now on this. So is that am I am I setting the stage correctly here? <laughs> You are, and I think I think probably you know your viewers and listeners um, you know know this, but I think it's important to acknowledge um, you know the the the, the problem. Um, you know, I think the businesses in the sports entertainment industry and the public venues industry. I that's again zoos, aquariums, convention centers, music theater, arts, um, in addition to stadia and, and sort of sports venues, arenas, etc. Um, you know. I think our business and industry has, again, through what has been known, right, as the sort of Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, we're just using that, um, sure. you know, just, just to, you know, kind of summarize um, that diversity, inclusion, land acknowledgements, um, you know, it, uh, those are all very important to us, right, in the business community. Now, coming from the philanthropic community and and, and business community, both, um, which is my upbringing, um, you know, it's not enough to just make those blanket statements, statements you know, right. um, because in the end, it's like, what are we doing about it? Like, you know, that is nice. And you need to build the, I think, you know, corporate America needs to build better relationships with its tribal, you know, community, for example, a good example, I, I've, I'm asked a lot to uh, weigh in on tribal um, community affairs, and I I will not answer those questions. Like that, that's not my. It's not the. It's my voice is not the one that needs to be heard. And the relationships, as I I point to corporate America, that you need to develop the relationships yourselves, right? Like you, that's the most important thing you can do. More important than a land acknowledgement, like that. That's super super important. But getting back to the problem, right? Like so, our industrialization, right? The consolidation of our food systems over the last century, I mean, we, we're aware of this, right? Like, and so right. again, the pandemic just sort of highlighted like, uh-oh, we have done so in a manner that has basically prevented us from actually keeping local foods, you know, in our own communities. Okay, so we, we know that, that. Let right? me stop you there. Cause cause that, that keeping food in local communities is a key element to the work that you were doing, right? Yeah, and I wanna, I also wanna bring seafood back into this because um, I think it's, it's pretty important. Um, but, but, you know, I, I see a different USDA that I've, I've never seen in 30 years. Um, I see a USDA right now leadership acknowledging, right, that there was systemic racism in these systems, right? Uh, sexism, sure. like, like, you know, they're, 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 not, they're not saying, well, we believe these to be true. They're saying it is true, right? And so... Um, you know, so so that's sort of part of the problem, right? So small, mid-scale growers, fishers, ranchers, you know, ag producers, you know, had sort of those systemic barriers. Then we had like this massive movement to like centralize and industrialize, and that created opportunities, right? And so um, you think about all that, you know, women additionally have had you know massive systemic barriers too, right? So what, what's interesting about this, right, right? is, you know, those are like the, the, the large scale stuff. Now I mentioned we got into the weeds, right? So right. what was preventing us from, you know, you know, here we go, you know, Hey, we want you all to feature these foods. Okay. And then you get, you know, the companies like Delaware North Compass Group I mentioned, or, or even just like the trailblazers, right. Um, right. You know, where I used to work, they're like, okay, Justin, we hear you. We get it. There's an equity standpoint. There's a community health. There's, you know, there's there's right. elements of, of sustainability, environmental stewardship in this, but but we we can't access, you know, the you know, right. And so right, and so we got to experience it too, right? 
So there was this inability, right? That, you know, all these barriers have created other, you know, these are rural producers for the most part. So processing, right? Just to get their food processed or to meet requirements on food safety insurance, the certification that's needed to get into this sort of large, you know, you know, market niche, you know, space, right? Um, thinking about how you speak the language, you know, of these buyer, you know, the, the food buyers in this, right? You know, how, how, how does this food get like an online system that it's available, right? So, so those are all like massive opportunities. And then just even honestly, Tom, like a, a refrigerated truck to get the food from the farm or the fisher, right? To an actual place where it can be processed to distribute, right? Um, how do we how do we keep these foods from spoiling? Refrigeration systems, freezers, you know, that's all an issue as well. All of these are barriers, right? And so it's going to take a large scale effort. So I go back to again, we've got the people aligned, right? They understand that they would like to feature these foods. They want to integrate them into their system. So now the government has stepped in, right? The government has said, okay, aha, right? We've got some barriers, we've our own systemic barriers. Um, we've got money, right, that we can flow out from grants and all that kind of stuff um, to pay for, you know, the, the, the infrastructure barriers. But their government's not good at doing, you know, like they may have the money, but they're not really the doers, right? So, so we must, you know, find a way, right? So that we all work together in this in this case. Now, I want to go back to fishing because, um, again, I mentioned that um, my colleague, um, Dr. Dunais, and I, you know, we worked on some sustainable fisheries work in conjunction with other philanthropy groups, not just the Paul Allen uh, Foundation. Um, and, you know, we developed Smart Catch. Some of you may, may know that program. I was one of the architects of that program, which is now being run by the James Beard Foundation. And, you know, we've got massive uh, systemic barriers, right? Um, you know, again, I, I mentioned, you know, getting hundreds of thousands of fish from sustainable waters in Alaska down to us to distribute, you know, to Northwest tribal communities, right? We mentioned that during the pandemic. Um, and in doing so, right, we, again, dove in, pun intended, to figure out, like, right. what's really happening here? And as we develop more relationships with our indigenous communities, we got to, you know, understand that in Alaska, right, uh, food harvested in Alaska isn't actually, like, kept in Alaska. It has to go all the way to Bellingham, right, to, you know, or Seattle to be processed because of, again, this sort of, like, the industrial system that we, we've approached, right? And so we want more of this beautiful, you know, healthy, sustainable product to get into the lower 48. We want to make sure that that food that's actually out of the Columbia River, Salish Sea, West Coast, Gulf, and on the East Coast is also, you know, into our own food systems, right? Like, so that, so I, I know we'll get to that in a little bit, but that's an incredibly important thing. So what we see, like, on the working waterfronts as systemic barriers, on the terrestrial land, it, it really is, it's almost the same barriers, right? It's, a, it's like this infrastructure to get community foods to stay, that grows within communities or is harvested within communities to stay local. It's the same infrastructure that is non-existent that is needed to get it into the marketplace, right? So we feel our role, like the leverage and opportunity is to help these foods get into the marketplace, right? So that's our whole thing. The wave marketplace is for us to help that happen, right? Supply and demand forces, the deployment of all those things, coordinating those efforts and get them moving. But guess what, Tom? That infrastructure deployed to get the foods into our systems, right, for purchasing and right. distribution and consumption is the same infrastructure that's needed to keep community foods that is harvested and produced within their own communities. And then we take the food of abundance, let's help get that food of abundance into the system. Let's help those farmers, ranchers, and fishers actually increase their capacity if they want to be entrepreneurial and, and get out, you know, grow their capacity and get them. We've got a great example. Uh, Yakima Nation um, uh, was, uh, has, you know, basically they're in one of the richest growing valleys of the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. They own the majority of the land. They have water rights. 
but they're fishers, um, historically speaking, um, sure. right? Um, and they recently acquired a 1,500 acre um, farm, uh, Nava um, Farms, but now it's Yakima Nation Farms. And so in their production of, you know, really awesome uh, fruits and vegetables, they want to think, right, about this agricultural line and growing agriculture as a new economic development um, line, right, for, for their tribe, for their community, et cetera. Um, and we're in partnership with them to say, as they kind of sort of take back their land leases from other farmers and develop more and more uh, of their own growing for both their own community, but they want to sell this off you know, to other communities as well. So again, that infrastructure that prevents them from keeping their own food, including the fish they catch on the Columbia River, right? right. Is, is refrigerated trucks, refrigerated storage, freezing, processing capacity, right? All of that is lacking, but needs to be deployed in order to get Yakima Nation Farms product to Alaska and all over the lower 48. So you've you've described the challenge. You've described the history. What's on the horizon? How does I'm 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 sensing a, a transformation going on here that the wave sees on the horizon. So talk a little bit about that marketplace you've just been describing. Yeah, and I've been talking about opportunity. I've been talking about leverage points, right? Uh, points of leverage, um, the carpe diem sort of um, model. Right. Um, another word or, or kind of a, a way of thinking about this value-based systems approach that people like Chef Jeffrey Mora, um, uh, Fisher poet Kevin Scribner, um, and, and others that have been helping develop um, sort of our mentality is obligation. Okay. Um, we, we take that emotion that I mentioned from the tribal elder who was raising a granddaughter in Yakima, the um, beautiful quote from Delson Suppa Sr., um, and the stories that are endless um, from both, you know, from tribal, the Black, the Latino, women producers, and fishers um, as well. And we, you know, as we get longer in the tooth dom and grayer, um, we know we would we know that we would feel shame mm -hmm. if if we did not try to help support this system getting better, right? And so we want to be very clear that we're not involved in all of it, right? We're we're really hyper-focused on how do we develop the marketplace in a way, right, that helps um, solve for the barriers, right? Right. Um, using, again, kind of back to demand and supply sources, right? right? So when, when the sports leagues the venues, the convention centers, the business and industry campuses, and then all of those food and beverage partners, the Delaware Norse Compasses, Sodexos, et cetera, that serve them, state that they want to materially know, right, that they're they're doing good with a budgets that already exist. Like they don't have to go find a budget for equity, um, for for you know, sure. um, um, to, you know, to help with environment. Like like they already have budgets for this, right? So it's using them. In a in a in a fashion that um, you know creates better impact, right? So so check, great, okay. So that's there, and there's this massive need and run to kind of do more in that space. They can you know they're even willing to pay even more for some of these products because they want to be able. So we want to make sure that the food being served in in this marketplace has equity, right? So um, giving those underrepresented producers. An opportunity to play where really large ag and, and, and some of the fishing um, you know, industry has had, right? We want to think about, um, I use sustainability, we talk about climate change, we talk about environmental stewardship. It's really about the health of our communities. Like, like, mm -hmm. like we mm -hmm. want to make sure the food that is being featured um, in this system is healthy for the workers, right? That you know, who, who's taking care of the people that are actually doing the work. 
um, and including act in the waterfronts, the active, you know, the working waterfronts. We want to make sure that the food being consumed is healthy, right? Um, so it's it's really thinking about clean label approaches to the food that's being put into these systems. And then we want healthy watersheds, right? So if sure. if the watershed's healthy, right? Um, we want to make this simple. Like there's a there, you know, you could go to, I'm not going to mention what and you know, what 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 NGO this might be, but 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 put any of the acronyms in there. A hundred base system that you know ensures that what you're you know what you're buying is meeting sort of MSC certification or whatever. Um, we want to keep this simple, right? It's like it is healthy for our watersheds, with the water the biggest watershed being the ocean, right? Like right. we want to make sure that health is the primary focus um, alongside of equity, right? E equitable access. So as we move right. forward as a nonprofit, we want to help make these systems better. So in the private sector. We know those people that are supporting the marketplace expansion of this type of system is who we want to support. So Five Star Chef, I mentioned Chef Jeffrey Mora. Um, Five Star Chef is a, is a private sector company um, that works with Sodexos and the Delaware North and the Compass Groups, et cetera, to help bring these foods to, to, to the system, right? So part of um, Five Star Chef um, leadership is a, a man named Bobby Soper. Uh, some of you may know him, CEO of Mohegan uh, Sun Gaming and Hospitality, um, and he is leading the effort. He's Mohegan himself and, and sort of leaving the effort of how do we make sure that uh, we're bringing in tribal, uh, we work with other partners um, such as the Black Food Sovereignty Coalition, the Rural Coalition, the Latino Farmers and Ranchers Association, and I can kind of go on and on with different um, acronyms and, and organizations, right. Local Catch Network, a lot of you know them. Um, you know, to ensure that the foods that we're featuring are going to be just as we described, right? They're hitting value-based equity and health, like super, super, super important for us. Um, as we look at those systems, right? So as we play our role, we want to make sure that we're helping develop more, right? Increasing the opportunity for more producers to be in that system. So one of the um, strategies, in addition to the Wave Foundation going out and seeking grants from the USDA or the EPA or state governments or whatever it is, right? We want to also um, develop a give back component. So I mentioned Five Star Chefs sort of being our point organization in the private sector, but we want percentages coming back to us from any economic activity that happens. And then we'll take that and reinvest it through grants um, technical support, consulting, whatever it happens to be, um, to to enable these producers to get into that game. So maybe that maybe grants could go towards a refrigerated truck, right? Like right. little things, or some training and technical assistance about how to become certified, or getting your insurance so that you can you know you can you can meet these requirements to be in the system. Or in the case of Alaska, you know, again, how do we develop ref, you know coolers and freezers so that community foods can stay within their communities, right? So we know we can play a role as we support those community-based organizations that are doing really good work to get these foods in the system, right? So that's kind of our like sort of project. It's our, the food, you know, the, 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 the wave marketplace initiative is to enable all of that sort of to happen. Okay. So we're, we're getting into near the end here, but I, this was, this is the forward looking initiative of the wave. Um, people can find out more about this on your website. Correct. Yeah. The, the wave nw.org. Well, um, it, 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 it kind of spells that out in more detail. Um, and kind of like you mentioned the, the sort of impacts of the past work during food and nutrition relief. Um, I, I would be, um, uh, I, I would, I, I want to make sure that people understand that we're a pro, our approach with the Wave Foundation and focusing on food systems is that the system itself is, is, is big. Like it's, um, you know, so we, we talked about the marketplace. Right. Um, we've talked about food and nutrition relief, right? So all the players that I just mentioned and have been in discussion with you about today all play roles in delivering food and nutrition relief. Like the NFL does the Super Bowl, they go into a community and they're going to participate in, 
and doing something with food relief in that in that community, right? And so we want to connect all the dots. We want we want that food relief to be featuring the same foods, right, that we have in the marketplace. We want to be thinking about how all these businesses have food waste and that we want them to be using that waste to feed people, right? We don't want food to 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 go on waste because of again, we, you know, serving people, the health of our, our, our soils, et cetera. We, so we don't want to waste seeing this food that's being produced as well. And then lastly, you know, we are still working on things such as getting that unused food, like the waste waste, back into the soils, right? Get, get sure. it back into the ag land. So we really think about this as a holistic picture, right, of food system reform that's needed. But again, our focus is, is really built on this is our industry. We have influence. Um, uh, and we've got we've got participants that want to play a role. So how do we help them do that? It's the development of all that stuff. But the marketplace really is the the sort of you know the tent pole that we can put down and say, okay, all this other great work can be done if we're if we're all playing a role in creating a more equitable food system. Yeah, and and, and Justin, I mean to be clear, the the way marketplace is a very innovative comprehensive system-wide approach to dealing with those challenges that were identified long before the, the pandemic, but also became more acute um, or critical during the pandemic. But also then you, you've looked and said, okay, now we can identify um, suppliers. So as you said, you've got the demand side, you've got the supply side. Now you're a central hub for getting that information together. And I'm going to presume, but I guess I shouldn't presume, I know that you guys are using your voice to get others to pay attention to this, others being elected officials, government agencies, et cetera, et cetera. How can people help you? do that is there a way that are you ready for that or is it yeah. still in the education phase no um you know we're we're now at the point where people are saying go you know like like let's 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 move forward i'm there there's a couple examples um that are under sort of nda at this point but but some of those partners that i mentioned we're in conversation with right now of setting up um, you know, guaranteed purchase orders to these food producers so that they, you know, we can start moving this stuff forward. Now to do it at scale, as opposed to it being sort of like a one-off here, a one-off there, we, we, you know, you know, we're looking for financial support. We believe um, through um, both the programs that the USDA has sort of uh, laid out um, through grant programs, um, you know, we're applying, we're actively applying for all those that make sense. Right. Um, we we also know that there's probably economic development assistance dollars um, that, that could be deployed. So those that are listening to this that might be in the influence of, um, uh, of earmarks and congressional spending uh, budgets, uh, farm bill, those are the kinds of places where we believe that if we could, you know, you, you know, receive some funding to get this moving forward even faster. I think, again, now is the opportunity. We're looking for those. I'm very encouraged, by the way, that this really is bipartisan when you're thinking about Congress. This is really bipartisan. I mean, what we're about, I mean, I know I get characterized as like, you know, a climate change guy or an environmentalist guy. And some people look at me and say, you're a capitalist, right? And so yeah, like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm all of that. Um, but what this is all about is really supporting America's you know, working lands, the natural resources and communities. This is about ensuring, right, that our agricultural system um, is more equitable, it's resilient, it's prosperous, right? So these are bipartisan, you know, th this is both sides of the aisle. Like, you know, why would you not want to foster more e equitable and competitive marketplaces? Why, you know, why would you not want to supply food to Americans that are nutritious, healthy, and culturally relevant, right? Why would you want to not have opportunities for economic development, right? And, and improve the quality of life at the same time, right? So this is what this is all about. So we're looking for, yeah, political support, economic support, um, you know, funding to help us get these systems up and running because once they're up and running, they're gonna self-sustain. Um, so for the next five to 10 years, we're really gonna be at it. Um, and, and so the more support we can get to help us bring more partners on, 
um, to deploy resources, again, to, uh, you know, increase infrastructure opportunities uh, through grants, all that kind of stuff. We, we welcome any and all. Please, please join us. Awesome. Well, as, as listeners, viewers can tell, Justin's very passionate about this. This is what got me engaged with Justin, was his passion for taking care of people. Food is a bipartisan issue um, or a nonpartisan issue. And um, we'll just wrap it up there, Justin. And let me say thank you. I'm looking forward to your success. Looking forward to having you back to talk a little bit more um, about where the, the wave marketplace has gone and the successes you have. So thank yeah, th you. Yo, thank you, Tom. And, and for your listeners, again, um, opportunities to uh, speak at any of your conferences or meetings. Uh, we're ready to go. And we've got some great people um, behind us as well that can join any kind of call. You know, we just want to get this out there to people and we want to see, you know, how many people will join the efforts. So thank you, Tom. Awesome. Really, really, really appreciate this opportunity. Well, thank you. And I will wrap up there. And as I mentioned at the start, this um, podcast webinar will be uh, available on YouTube, Facebook, as a podcast on the normal application podcast applications. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, we'd ask you to share it with your friends. Um, we're working on our next Waterside chat. But if you'd like to and you want to keep up to date, you can go to our website and sign up for the email list there. Um, and until then, thank you and thanks for watching and, and listening. Thanks, Justin. Thank you.